Thank you, everyone. Honorable Sumandiran, you have 35 minutes. Thank you, uh, Honorable Presiding Member. As I begin, I must uh, put on record and correct certain misapprehensions that some members seem to be harboring with regard to our party's position with regard uh, in respect of this uh, resolution. I'll read out the statement that we issued on the day the resolution was adopted. The Tamil National Alliance welcomes the passage of today's resolution on Sri Lanka at the, end, at the Human Rights Council. We have welcomed it. We welcome in particular Sri Lanka's co-sponsorship of the resolution, indicating their willingness to implement it in full. The TNA has already welcomed the tabling of the draft last week after consensus was reached and reiterate those sentiments. We hope that the spirit of cooperation that enabled consensus will animate the government's work in implementing this historic resolution. Today's resolution reflects a difficult consensus and involved the weakening of some paragraphs in the original draft resolution and the strengthening of others. We are deeply mindful that any perceived compromise causes hurt to those most traumatized by the horrific crimes that have been committed in Sri Lanka. Nevertheless, the resolution, if implemented, provides a genuine opportunity for real progress on accountability and reconciliation. We are grateful to the co-sponsors of the resolution for engaging with the TNA throughout the process and accommodating our concerns and views. This remains our position to date. So I urge the honorable members who perhaps misunderstood our position. As much as you say that you worked on reducing the hard impact of this resolution, we have in our statement said that some of those weakening of those paragraphs have hurt the sentiments of people's, people who are most traumatized. But we have gone on to say, nevertheless, that this gives an opportunity to move forward together. And it is in that spirit that we have welcomed it. And we are happy today that members of the United National Party and members of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, the two biggest parties in this country, are agreed that this resolution must be implemented. That you really, what you are saying is that you really did, didn't even need this uh, prodding from international community, that you yourself want to do it. That was reflected when you co-sponsored it. Now, when you co-sponsor a resolution, it's more than agreeing to the resolution. It is taking ownership for the resolution. You, this resolution is not that of the UN Human Rights Council anymore. This is your resolution. Nobody who stands up and proposes a resolution or seconds it, in this case, co-sponsors it, can then say, we will decide now what parts of this resolution that we like, that we can implement, and so on. This is your resolution. You fully own it. And we congratulated you on the 1st of October 2015 for taking that bold step. And we congratulate you today for taking the bold step of abiding by this resolution for speeches made on both sides of the House affirming that this resolution is supportive of the process, processes that you yourself wish to initiate for accountability and for reconciliation in Sri Lanka. 
and we are fully supportive of that. The Honorable Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, when he made the speech on the 14th of September at the UN Human Rights Council, very clearly said, we are no longer in the land of denial. He was very bold. He even went to the extent of saying, we have failed in the past. Several commissions were appointed. Nothing saw the light of day. Reports were not even made public. Then he appealed and said, but have trust in us. We are different now. We will deliver. And I must say, your actions today in this house has demonstrated that. When he made that statement, we said, well, it's all good for him to say that in words. But he himself says that successive governments have not delivered, have failed. And having said that, merely asking people now have confidence in us will not work. People must see action. People must see it being implemented. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, they say. They must actually see it happening. So I want to repeat what we said on the 14th of September again in this house, not from a, a sense of superiority or anything like that, but as fellow citizens, appeal to you and say, let the people actually see it, feel it, and experience it. Your words today are most welcome. But please remember they remain only words up to now. This resolution must be implemented in full. I say in full because I was rather disturbed when Honorable Mahinda Samarasinghe sought to make a distinction between implementing the 13th Amendment and implementing the 13th Amendment in full. I asked him, what's the difference? If it makes any difference, after this, every sentence, you must say, I will do this. You can't say, I will do this. I will do that in full. If you give a commitment to do something, you do it. You don't come and say, I never said I will do it in full. So, because of that speech made in the morning, I'm, I'm saying now that this resolution must be implemented in full. Otherwise, I would have stopped with the words, it must be implemented. But it must be implemented in full for the reason that I already stated that this is your resolution. Nobody else's. Not ours. You co-sponsored it. And this promise that the Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs made very rightly and very boldly must be kept because it is in keeping that that we can together stand up in the international community and show the others and show the others that we keep our word that we deal with these difficult issues. These are difficult issues, no doubt. But the measure of our country in the international community will be known only when we keep to our word and we implement. We actually show it uh, in action. I want to say a word about sovereignty. Since that word is often misused, sovereignty is a right of a people, perhaps of a republic, to rule themselves, to retain for themselves the right to make decisions and to implement them, not to concede it to one person or two or anybody else. It is a right of the people. And that is what our Constitution also says, that sovereignty resides in the people. 
But that cannot mean that sovereignty can be exercised only by some people to the exclusion of others. And that has been the problem in this country because there are several peoples who inhabit this island. They are in different proportions. Some are 70%, some are 20%, some are 10%, some may be 5%, even less. But that doesn't mean that a particular group that is superior in numbers can solely exercise sovereignty and exclude others from exercising any measure of sovereignty. That has been the issue that has plagued this country. And if we are now truly turning around, if we are now seeing a new path, that must be a path in which every single person, every citizen must have equal citizenship right, irrespective of which people's group he or she belongs to. That right of sovereignty must be real. It's not with regard to citizens and non-citizens or colonial rulers. It is also within this country that some, merely because of numerical superiority, don't hold that sovereignty to themselves and exclude others from in, having any share in that sovereignty. That would be a mistake. I'm saying this because several statements were made with regard to sovereignty. It is because we were excluded, because we were specifically excluded when a Republican constitution was made in 1972, that this issue heightened. Firstly, it was equality. It was discrimination. But first and second Republican constitution excluded us from the exercise of sovereignty, from the exercise of state power. And that is why we said, well, if you exclude us, then let us have our own way. Leave us alone. Uh, my party president, Mr. Sena, Honorable Senad Raja, read out to you a newspaper article of a, me of a meeting that was held recently where several members of this house, I'm sad to say, have said, we will now create a single state in this country. Now, if that is the case, then necessarily you will have to allow us to be by ourselves because we don't belong to the Sinhala state. I'm a Sri Lankan, but I'm not a Sinhalese. The Sinhalese are a great race with a long tradition. You can be proud of your heritage, but I don't belong to that race. I'm a Tamil. And I'm equally proud of my race. Being a Tamil, I have my own heritage. Equally long, if not longer. So therefore, if you talk in terms of sovereignty and imply that, so that sovereignty means that only the Sinhala people of this country can exercise it, then you yourself are telling us to divide. We are not asking for it. You, or the, the persons who say that this is a Sinhala country are the very persons who are telling us to divide, to be separate. You are the separatists, not us. I said I'm very saddened that several members of this house are saying that. But I'm glad that they, are, they can be counted on one's fingers. Only a few. And that is why I said at the beginning of my speech that I'm glad that the two major parties have agreed to today that this resolution that the government, this government is also a hybrid government. This is a season for hybrids. We, first we had the cars. Now we have a government that is a hybrid government. Let's have a quote that also reflects the new trend. That will give confidence. That will give confidence to 
the people most traumatized by the violence. Whatever mechanism that you institute will be useless if it does not have the confidence of the victims. It must be something that the victims appreciate. It must be something that the victims accept as a just mechanism. Grandeur illusions of sovereignty cannot instill in the victims a sense of belonging, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of justice. The credibility of that mechanism is the most important aspect, not what we think is our sovereignty. So if you are truly concerned about reconciliation, if you are true to your word about being responsible with regard to accountability, then you must strictly adhere to what you yourself have proposed in the resolution. And in the resolution, we have very specifically stated the importance uh, of certain persons participating in that special court. Certain persons who will not be citizens of this country participating. It says the importance of that participation. Now when you identify that as an important element, not the UN Human Rights Council, but you yourself, you have underlined it and said this is important, that judges, prosecutors, lawyers, and investigators, you have categorized them, four categories. And you have said it is important that Commonwealth and foreign personnel participate. Surely, it must be participation by them in those very capacities. Otherwise, as somebody said, technical assistance and so on, no. If it is technical assistance from international community, you say technical assistance from international community. You don't separately identify the different categories of persons participating. A judge participates qua judge. A prosecutor participates qua prosecutor. A lawyer participates qua lawyer. An investigator participates in his capacity as an investigator, not to sit and give advice as to how this is to be done. So uh, we urge more than you that this resolution must be implemented. Isn't it strange that the government sponsors a resolution and we are saying we are more keen that you implement it in full, more than, more than you, because, because we represent the victim community. We represent, I am not saying that only the Tamil peoples are, people are victims in this country. Many people are victims through this war. But if you take it as a whole, we perhaps represent those most traumatized by the violence. Because of that end period was most traumatic. And most allegations about violations about war crimes, about crimes against humanity, arise from that period. And as true political representatives of those people, of that community, it is our bounden duty to raise these concerns, to underline what you yourself have underlined in the resolution. <laughs> And we wish to underline and highlight it today, the importance of such a mechanism, the importance of such proper participation, without which 
your mechanism for justice will fall flat on its face. We congratulate you for adopting the principles of transitional justice. The Honourable Minister spoke about it, spoke about the four pillars of transitional justice, of truth, of justice, of reparation, and the guarantee of non-recurrence. The second pillar of justice must not only be done, but also be seen to be done. And that is what Sir Desmond has said, quoted, by, quoted in the Parnagama Commission. That is what Sir Desmond de Silva QC is reported to have said when he was a prosecutor in Gambia. And what has he said? He has said for people to have any confidence, all of these people, prosecutors and judges, all of them, not a hybrid, he says all of them must come from outside. You are Sir Desmond. I say you are Sir Desmond because Desmond de Silva gave an opinion to the government of Sri Lanka on the 23rd of February 2014. Five months before he was appointed to the panel of experts by President Mahindra Rajapaksa. Five months prior to being identified and paraded to the world as an independent expert. He gave an opinion for which fees was paid by the government of Sri Lanka on the very questions that were gazetted for him to assist the commission to find answers on distinction, on proportionality, and on collateral damage. On all of these three principles, he gave a written opinion dated the 23rd of February 2014, and five months later, he was brought in as an independent expert. On the last occasion I spoke on this matter, I said this is clear conflict of interest. Any final year law student who studies ethics will know that. And I urge the government of Sri Lanka to make a complaint against him to the UK Bar Standards Committee. I'm thankful somebody has made a complaint. And Sir Desmond de Silva is now facing disciplinary inquiry before the UK Bar Standards Committee. But the point I'm making is that even Sir Desmond de Silva, even Sir Desmond de Silva, when he was performing another role, when he was not paid by the Sri Lankan government, when he was paid, he gave another opinion. But when he was not paid by the Sri Lankan government, when he was prosecuting in Gambia in the first internationalized court, the first hybrid court, he was a prosecutor. His opinion then was that everybody must come from outside. Everybody must come from outside. So the point I'm making is, even the person you bought for money, when he was not bought by you for money, gave that opinion an independent opinion. Look at the Parnagama Commission report. Quite contrary to what Honorable Lakshman Zanimaratna said, we are not picking what we like from this report and that report and putting together and, and saying others are bad. That's not what we are doing. He must follow the argument properly. What we are saying is that Parnaga, we wanted the Parnagama Commission's mandate terminated forthwith. We never had any confidence in the Parnagama Commission sittings. In fact, the OISL report and in its recommendation says terminate that commission, terminate that mandate. That has no credibility. Even today, that is our position with regard to the Parnagama Commission. The point that we are making, though, is very different. What we are saying is, even such a bad commission, even that commission couldn't escape from saying that Channel 4 video doesn't seem to be faked. It seems genuine. All of those photographs of extrajudicial executions don't seem to be faked, they seem to be genuine. Therefore, conduct an independent judicial inquiry. 
because my i i will mr chairman i will at this point say that because parnagama commission report on those three vital questions for, for which they got international so called expert help on distinction on proportionality and collateral damage went with sir despens prior opinion to the sri lankan government they did not exercise their mind to the matter they went with a paid opinion and reproduced it in this report they had to strike some balance they had to show something that seems to be reasonable and these are the issues that they have highlighted of of surrendering under a white flag several other surren surrenders of disappearances now there must be answers found to this there must be persons held responsible for this it is not only the army's atrocities that are highlighted in the oisl report the oisl report of the un human rights high commissioner identifies several acts of the ltte and terms them war crimes we have very specifically in our statements welcome the entire report and we have gone further and said this also gives to us to the tamil people an opportunity to introspect and as the tamil national alliance we have said we are prepared to lead our people through that painful process of introspection of looking inward looking to see what went wrong with us now we are prepared to do that it's not a politically expedient thing it is not a populist thing it will bring us under severe a sharp focus but we are willing to do that because if we are to move forward if the word reconciliation if the word accountability is to have any meaning in this country at all for the future we must be prepared to do that and that is why i am happy that today in this house the two major parties have taken that seriously take an accountability seriously stop being a, a government of denial accept well these horrific things did happen we are all ashamed that this happened but let's see how we can deal with that justly honestly transparently to the satisfaction of the victims more than anybody else not to boost our image not to think of what will the other countries think of us of our national image as it were let me say most humbly that we will only elevate our national image we will only elevate our national image if we truly deal with these issues and rightly deliver justice without sweeping these matters under the carpet and let me conclude mr chairman that as for the tamil national alliance we are willing to give the government our fullest support for the full implementation of this resolution the resolution that you sponsored we accept with its limitations still we accept but we want it we want to see it fully implemented there it's not an easy task we understand it's not easy for you it is not easy for us but we have made a start and we are willing to go with you in that journey and our, our appeal to you is that you stand firm in your resolve to go through that difficult path and don't give in to extremist voices because extremist voices on both sides can be marginalized fully if we come together and deal with this